All right, everybody, this is Ross. The yard at this time of the year is looking amazing. This right here in front of me is not a flowering cherry. Well, it's not an ornamental cherry, excuse me. This is a fruiting cherry called white gold. Got a lot of fruit set this year that I should be expecting. And it's now in full bloom. And this is kind of the time you gotta really appreciate these trees because fruit trees are beautiful, I would argue, but they're not meant to be ornamental. The flowers don't last, unfortunately, very long. The petals fall off quicker. The bloom time is shorter. And while they are beautiful for a very short period of time, it's really about the fruit that you're after and not the flowers. But regardless, this time of the year in the spring, it is the most beautiful time of the year. And so I wanted to highlight that in this video, show you guys the different trees around the property, fruiting shrubs, vines, and the fruit trees of all different types that we're growing to highlight really just how beautiful and ornamental having a backyard orchard can be. Of course, the persimmons here are definitely always one of the last things to wake up in my yard. They take their time, whereas other things here like the black raspberries and the raspberries and different brambles, in fact, that you may have in your yard, they'll typically leaf out at an earlier date. But what's really, I think, unfortunate for some of these trees that do flower and do leaf out early is that they can be susceptible to late frost. And so we do have on my apricot here, this is called tomcot. We do have a number of apricots that have set on this particular tree. And you can see that there, there's one little guy, the beginnings of the apricots. Isn't that beautiful guys? We have uh, quite a few more see some other guys on here that are kind of just breaking through that shuck that they have which is the flower the outer flower once the apricot is set but we're not out of the woods yet um, we're definitely not out of the woods and we can still have a late frost that comes in here in the philadelphia area although today is 80 degrees the plums and the plots are in a very similar state they've already flowered the flowers actually look rather sad if there is anything left and they're breaking through their shucks as well. Hundreds of peaches and pluots, I'm sorry, plums and pluots. But you know what? We have to thin them. And of course, we also have to spray them. And here in the mid-Atlantic, you're just inevitably going to deal with plum cucurlio. It is what it is and we can spray organically. We can spray responsible things like kale and clay or surround it's called. And that way we don't have to really worry about consuming these things or damaging other things and, and also affecting pollinators. We'll do this after the plums and apricots have set as they have, but get to a slightly larger size because that plum cucurlia will bite every single plum and pluot, insert larva into those bites and if they don't insert the larva and then you don't have worms in them, you actually end up getting brown rot and a disease called brown rot that ruins the quality of the fruits. And you don't wanna eat them, you can't really eat them. Uh, and that happens at the end of the year. And then that brown rot spreads to other, other trees and other fruits. And it just ruins your entire crop. And for years actually, I've had a very unsuccessful crop of plums because that plum cucurlio destroys every single plum. So I don't like to spray anything, but it's actually a necessity here in probably for most of you in the, in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, here we have behind me is a Japanese um, pear called Chijuro or an Asian pear called Chijuro. I'm not sure if it is Japanese actually, but it sounds Japanese. And this is one of my favorites for sure. And the fact that it's blooming right now and it's been very warm and we're not really expecting to see too much rain in the forecast. And if we do, we're gonna have a lot of sunny days. That's a good sign for fire blight because fire blight typically spreads when the flowers are open. And that's really the main cause of concern for pears in this, this location. We don't wanna have 
that fire blade damage that gets into the pears. And so if you have a neighborhood pear tree that's quite diseased, that no one really takes care of, it again flowers, and that then that disease gets in to this pear tree or your other pear trees as they're flowering. And that can take an entire branch and kill it. And if you don't catch it very quickly, it can spread even further down the tree and you may have to take out your entire tree, unfortunately. But again, if, it, if it's clear and it's not cloudy and it's sunny, there's a lot less uh, likely of a chance that you'll actually see fire blight spread to your pear trees. So I think we're looking pretty good on that front. It's too early to tell, but the pollinators are out. They're looking beautiful. You could tell they're hungry. We've got as well these peaches over here that have been espied. I espied these guys years ago and we've just been continually opening the center at the top layer, the top tier. I pruned out a lot of growth out of these trees. In fact, I'm not really afraid to prune uh, at all. And I'm not really afraid to prune those peach trees in particular. This is some of the growth that we actually pruned out of these peaches. And that is a lot of fruit potentially, but we're better off for it because we're getting rid of this excess growth and we're opening up that center. We're opening things up, allowing more light. And that way we're gonna have better quality fruits. I'd rather have 300 really good peaches than 600 okay or below average peaches. And so these trees are still gonna produce a ton of fruit. Every, every flower potentially represents a, a peach. Of course, we have to thin them out to every four or five inches. But the better light we get in here in the center, I've tried really hard to focus on branches that again, are coming outwards and sort of downwards like this, while still maintaining this espie form here of a three-tier system, even though it's devolved a bit from that. Um, this has been uh, wonderful. And you can actually see, like, look how through the center, it's just a clear shot. We have really good airflow in here that's gonna prevent that brown rot. Of course, we need to spray just like the plums, just like the apricots. The plums are definitely by far the worst, but if we can prevent that plum cacurlio from proliferating this year, we can have less pest pressure in the future. And I would argue uh, the less of that we have, obviously the less brown rot we have and the better my peaches could particularly be, especially on this Alberta, that ripens later in the season and can be affected by that a bit more. Um, so that's the story there with the peaches, the apricots, stone fruits in general, and the pears. We also have a lot of fig trees in this property and they're all leafing out. They are absolutely loving this warm weather that we've been having. I'm so excited for this fig season. The garlic, by the way, this is really small cloves of garlic that I planted. And th this is probably the best the garlic's ever looked. It's just been so mild here. Look at that. It's been absolutely amazing. I'll get plenty of scapes from that hard neck garlic. We also have in this bed here, the strawberries. I transplanted in my white Alpine strawberries and they're looking fantastic. They're starting to flower. I'll get to enjoy some of those. I'm trying to propagate more of them right now in the commercial greenhouse I have access to. We got some young grapevines that we're training here along this wire, along the fence. We've also got another young one down here that I'm hoping will, by the end of the season, get to the top of this trellis here, this um, arbor that I constructed last year. We also have the apples that we thinned out, if you guys recall. In the fall last year, we thinned out roughly 20 apple trees out of here. <laughs> You're probably wondering, how did I have 20 apple trees in here? But I did. Um, we left really the good ones. We left, uh, this is King David right here. And we're getting some fruit set, hopefully. Some flowers on that. That's what I'm hoping for. Because of that extra light, the same principles can be applied to any fruit tree, any fruiting plant. Just getting more light 
means we're going to have less disease and better fruits and even better production typically. So getting that through the center is critical. The same thing's happening here with these dwarf, these dwarf apples. They were just too close together. There wasn't enough sunlight in this shady spot back here. However, I did transplant in this quince. This is Arrow Matnaya. I hope this gets more light and more growth and maybe will fruit next season. This is Gravenstein. I did save this branch. We got Golden Russet and Sweet 16 on this tree. I also grafted, um, I think this is Blue Paramain right here. And this should take. We also have uh, Black Oxford. I transplanted a couple apple trees elsewhere on the property. We just planted this Cornelian Cherry. Shout out to the guy who told me about this on Instagram. Sorry, man, I'm blanking on your name, but this is the Elegant Cornelian Cherry. He convinced me to grow one of those. This will fill in a little bit of this area here. We also put in a trailing blackberry down here that, um, actually this is a Loganberry, thornless trailing Loganberry. We're also gonna plant underneath here because we've got a lot of comfrey that comes up every year. Very soon will be flowering, but I'm gonna fill in this whole area underneath these fruit trees with different flowering plants. Perennials, probably even plant a little bit of annuals in here and just try to really make this full of flowers for the pollinators. This gumi berry is amazing. I love it every single year. It puts out a ridiculous crop every year. It's never been biennial. We also have the amazing flower bulbs below it. For, uh, excuse me if I don't know the name of these. I think they're tulips. Pretty sure they're tulips. I think I'll probably be cutting those today, giving those to my girlfriend, maybe some to my mom, so they can do some flower arrangements. But the gumi berry is just covered in flowers. The bees have been all over this. Little parasitic wasps, little bees. Young bees is what I'm trying to say. Um, and they're just loving all this flowers and stuff in the yard. They're of course in the big shade trees above me as the oaks and maples are flowering. This is a Hawaii apple. And I'm thinking because now there's so much light in here, the trees are of course more likely to flower and then hold on to those fruits. The less light we have in here, the, more, the less energy the trees have and the less chance I even get apples to grow. I've had a lot of trees in here that flower profusely, but they just don't hold on to the apples. We've also had squirrel problems and I've taken care of that as time has gone on. We definitely have a lot less squirrels than in the past. Here's the muscadines. I'm wondering if instead of spur pruning these muscadines, if I would be better off uh, kind of spur pruning them maybe throughout the growing season or even maybe uh, doing a different style of pruning them. Instead of uh, doing the spur pruning, I could kind of just leave up some of these branches and kind of form more of a bushier um, vine. You know, on these vinifera and labrusca grapes here that I have, it's a very different method of pruning. You could see there, this Mars grape is just starting to leaf out, which will produce all the little clusters on here. Hopefully we get a good amount of clusters. This honeyberry actually, although it produces a good amount of fruit, has kind of shaded this portion of the, of the vine. And so there's not really a ton of growth that shows up here, which is kind of a shame. So I think what I'll do is probably train this bud here up to this wire to come across this way because that section of the vine is just not getting enough light, unfortunately. And so that's really the name of the game here, guys. We need to give everything the appropriate amount of light. It's already very shaded back here in this food foresty setting I have. This is an espiade plum, a plum that we're beginning the phases here of espieing again. We just grafted it last season. I planted a little acai kiwi berry down here. I'm hoping that thing will fruit on its own, produce good fruit quality as well. I've heard a lot of problems with it, but we'll see. We definitely have to really mulch it well and improve the soil probably in that spot a little bit more. Uh, we also have the pawpaw, which is of course flowering uh, again this year, which is really a welcome sight. Maybe we'll get 
uh, I'm hoping for about 20 or so pawpaw. Again, the squirrels aren't going to be around nearly as much this year, so we should be able to get really, really good ones off of the tree. Both of these trees, actually. There's a mango and a PA golden here. They are incredibly good when picked appropriately. If you can pick them at the last moment, they are so, so good. Another, actually another pair here. This is the Purdue pair. I think Purdue University bred that one. The persimmons over here are just starting to leaf out. These are the Americans. We've got Proc doing its thing and Celebrity. All the persimmons are very late to leaf out. Here's a uh, Sejo. I'm hoping to get some Sejo this year. Wouldn't that be exciting? This gooseberry is oddly very slow to leaf out this year compared to everything else in the yard. It's uh, cousin, the Yostaberry. Is it its cousin or it's... Actually, it's child, the Yostaberry. Over here is already starting to do its thing and looks to be fully loaded with flowers. So uh, I don't know why that one's taking its time, but you can see all the fruits on this Yostaberry this year. That's exciting. This is a, definitely a very good piece of fruit that I much prefer to the current. And uh, it does resemble more of that gooseberry than a current. We also have some newer plants over here that we planted and so that is an elderberry and uh, I made some elderberry syrup last year for the first time and this will fill in this whole area probably pretty good we put down a lot of wood chips and created this area here we extended this which I was really excited about because we did take out this shade tree over there that we had which is going to allow a little bit more light to come in this way uh, not a ton. This is overall a very shady spot, but we do have some shade tolerant fruiting plants in here. And of course we do have some mushrooms that we put in here. So underneath these wood chips is wine cap that I inoculated. You basically put down some cardboard, you put down some wood chips, you put down some of that mycelium, you put down more of the wood chips, more mycelium. You create a kind of a lasagna layer and probably I may even see some this spring, believe it or not. I may see a flush this fall. And the latest, I would argue, would probably be by um, the spring next year. But all these wood chips are giving the um, mycelium all of this food to eat. And the wood chips will eventually break down actually very quickly with this wine cap that helps add an incredible amount of fertility to the soil. Um, I mean, that's one of the keys to planting anything new. If you really wanted to plant any fruit tree, any perennial in your yard, always a great idea to put down mulch, put down anything, not just wood chips, leaves, straw, other materials. This stuff breaks down. And in the case of the uh, wine cap, breaking down these wood chips, it's an incredible amount of fertility just very quickly. I mean, of course you can add organic material like compost that's already broken down, but the amount of worms and lice that will be in here, other types of fungus, actually here's um, some mycelium right here on this particular wood chip, put that back in there. But in this space here, we have a, a young grafted Girardi mulberry that I grafted myself. It came up from a seedling over there, I dug it up this fall, put it right in the ground. This only gets about six by six. We also have this ruby autumn olive. And because I love the, the gummy berry so much, this is related. I figured, why not try it? What's the difference, right? Uh, I'm sure the fruit quality is not going to be as good, but what's nice about the autumn olive, guys, is that this fruits much later in the season than the gummy. And so you just have hopefully something similar to the gumi ripen later in the year in the fall and the gumi of course covers the earlier part of the year it's one of the first fruits to ripen and usually finishes by the first or second week of of july here in the philadelphia area next to me is also an aronia berry haven't really grown one of those before i have tried them at someone's yard uh, in princeton that's growing unusual fruits and they were just too astringent for me. But if you can really let them hang on the bush, 
um, you should be able to get rid of almost all of the astringency. And worst comes to worst, you freeze them, you do other things with them. I like having different types of uh, berries that give you, you know, a lot of different types of fiber and antioxidants, and that really helps improve your health. Then, of course, we've got another persimmon back here. This is, I think, Meator. This is another persimmon, kind of similar to Proc, in that it has a lot of that dried fruit flavor to it. And so this space is going to be overrun, probably, with fruit trees. Uh, again, very close together, but it's probably the best I could do, um, given the circumstances and given the limited area I have to plant in. But... Um, yeah, everything's going to be doing great and hopefully this can kind of take over this area here and we'll have more of that food forest that we have over on this side kind of continued. Um, and so that's kind of the gist of what's going on here, guys. There's a lot on the other side, actually, the persimmons and the blueberries and the honeyberries over there, the chays over there, the asparagus is coming up. We also have uh, jujubes and all kinds of other things on the west side of the property. This tour is getting a little long. I'll leave you guys with this pomegranate. Once again, this pomegranate has survived the winter. This is the Salavatsky, quite hardy. And uh, to me, it's been really proven itself. I don't think it's gonna produce the highest fruit quality, but if it survives the winter, that's enough for me really really love pomegranates and they go in so many different things even if you're not eating them fresh like you would probably most of your fruits they're just incredible so i'm hoping we can get some flowers this is really the year that i've i've been expecting big things especially with this mild winter this year and last year we should have very minimal damage on here and i should get a large crop to show for it but Getting these things to flower is a little bit difficult now that there is kind of a bigger surface area that this is covering. I would, I have kind of higher hopes for it and um, maybe we can see some spurs on this, which is kind of my goal at this point is hopefully some spurs have formed. They do form, the flowers form on spurs, kind of like a pear or an apple. Um, but, however, it's hard to identify them, the spurs, and they also do fruit on new, new growth. So uh, we'll have to see what this tree wants to do. You know, it's just not in our control. Um, we barely prune it. I try not to touch it. Um, I don't want to be, you know, messing with it too much. I have pruned out the lower growth sometimes to keep the bottom a little bit clean. And that may have actually delayed the fruiting a little bit. Um, simply just due to the fact that uh, we might have been pruning out some of the older wood down there that might have the spurs and things on it. Um, but again, it, you never know with these trees. It's, it's still a learning process. But this, I think, is year four with this Salavatsky in this spot. And uh, we'll see what it does. It's pretty much survived the winter every year I've had it here. And I think it's even gotten down to close to zero which is where it's said to actually uh, go down to. This to me looks like a spur right here. Very unusual growth. Um, so to me that looks like a spur and it just looks in general like a spur. It doesn't have that pointy growth that, uh, that you normally see. But anyway guys, that's the story. I hope you guys enjoyed this tour. If you're, uh, you got this far, I appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button. Check out my blog, figboss.com. Give the video also a like. And uh, that way you guys can stay tuned with further videos here coming up on the, on the channel. See you guys for the next one. Take care.